he just, said to me. That's what. No, he said to me that he wasn't gonna leave. He said he's he's just gonna be really, really shit. So he said to me something like, "Oh yeah, of course he is. Really? Well, what do you like? Because it just doesn't like me." You know? You'd be like Johnny, like, if I could just tell you, like, I would be able to look at them. Like, but I tried, like, before this, like, so I don't come back to it again, yeah. 20 days later, Fiona Sinnott disappeared after leaving a pub in Broadway, County Wexford. The 19-year-old mother of one has not been seen since. Her case is now being treated as a murder investigation. In September 2005, a male was arrested on suspicion of Fiona's murder. The man in question was, and remains, the only suspect in her disappearance. Also arrested were the suspect's mother, his sister, his sister's boyfriend, his ex-girlfriend and a male friend. All six were later released without charge. Both the Gardaí and Fiona's family believed that she was murdered and then buried somewhere in the south of County Wexford. I cannot directly name the suspect in Fiona's murder. However, there is nothing stopping me from laying out the facts. To understand Fiona's story, we need to go back to the mid-1990s when she met her boyfriend, Sean Carroll. Fiona grew up in Bridgetown in County Wexford. She was just 16 years old when she met Sean. He was 10 years her senior, owned a motorbike and fit the bad boy stereotype. When she was 17, they started renting an apartment on George Street in Wexford Town. At first, the relationship was exciting and the couple would often go on motorbike trips together. However, it did not take long for things to turn sour. According to Fiona's family, Sean became controlling and violent. Fiona was hospitalized on more than one occasion but refused to press charges. These attacks were quickly followed by apologies, excuses and empty guarantees that it would never happen again. When she forgave him and agreed to take him back, there would be a short period of calm before the cycle started all over again. Her medical records show that she was kicked, bitten and punched in the face. This abuse continued even while she was heavily pregnant. On February 28, 1997, Fiona gave birth to their daughter, Emma. Three months later, Fiona, Sean and Emma left Wexford Town and moved to a small cottage in Ballyhit. Ballyhit is a rural townland. It lies to the east of Broadway in Ladies Island Lake in the south of County Wexford. It was here that Fiona picked up the courage to end things with Sean. In November of 1997, they broke up yet again. However, on this occasion, she stood firm and refused to take him back. Following their breakup, Fiona continued living at the cottage with her daughter Emma. Meanwhile, Sean moved into his parents' house in Codstown, Killinick. By the time 1998 rolled around, Fiona was keen to move on and start afresh. She now had an infant daughter and a place to call her own. For months, Sean refused to accept that the relationship was over. Instead, he chose to make life difficult for Fiona. According to her family, he once told her, I will never give you a minute's peace. On Friday, February 6th, 1998, the Carroll family collected Emma from Fiona's cottage. This was the norm as she often spent the weekend with her dad and grandparents in Codstown. The Carrolls would collect Emma on a Friday evening and then bring her back to Fiona's house the following Monday. That Friday night, Fiona and her friends had drinks at the Tusker House Hotel in Ross Lair. There, she met a Welsh truck driver named Gary James. When Fiona got in Gary's truck, Sean appeared and started banging on the locked door and yelling at her to get out. Terrified, she refused to exit the cab. Two days later, on Sunday, February 8, Fiona joined three of her friends at a local pub called Butler's, which was a 20 minute walk from her cottage. That evening, the group sat at a table and chatted about their previous night out in Ross Lair. At some point, Sean Carl entered Butler's and sat at the bar. Fiona, who seemed surprised by his arrival, did not greet him. For the rest of the evening, Sean remained at the bar by himself, drinking pints and smoking cigarettes. Shortly after midnight, Fiona bought some peanuts and left. Moments later, Sean also went outside. According to the Gardaí, this was the last confirmed sighting of Fiona Sinnott. 
After leaving Butler's, it is believed that the pair walked north on L3060 before heading east towards Mill Pond Cross. They would have then walked south on L7105. Sean said that he accompanied Fiona home, slept on her couch and was picked up by his mother the following morning. In February of 2024, Fiona's family publicly expressed doubts about Sean's claim that he spent the night at the cottage. In a Facebook post, they questioned why he would have slept on a three-foot chair in the living room when there was a spare bed in one of the rooms. There seems to be conflicting details about witness accounts that night. The Gardaí have said that a passing motorist saw a couple arguing by Kisha Cross, which is just 550 metres north of Butler's pub. Former cold case detective Alan Bailey gave a slightly different account in his book, Missing Presumed. According to Bailey, a passing motorist saw a couple arguing near the entrance of a local quarry. Around the same time, a resident in the Mill Pond Cross area heard a woman screaming. The area in question is just 500 metres north of Fiona's cottage. Of course, it is possible that both of these accounts are true. Sean claimed that he woke up the following morning and gave Fiona three pound. He said that she had been complaining about pains in her arm and upper body and that she was planning on visiting her doctor. It later came to light that she had never visited a doctor that day. Theories that she had moved to England were also quickly disproven. Two days after Fiona was last seen in public, the prime suspect in her disappearance approached her landlord and asked to gain access to the cottage. The landlord refused as Fiona was the registered tenant. Three days later, he returned again. On this occasion, he was accompanied by his mother. The pair told the landlord that Fiona had made contact from London and that they needed access to her cottage. These interactions occurred five to eight days before Fiona's family realized that she had gone missing. During this period, locals saw black bags lined up outside the property. Unfortunately, the killer had a significant amount of time to cover his tracks, as 10 days passed before it became apparent that Fiona was missing. Fiona was an independent 19-year-old who lived more than 15 kilometers away from her family home. She did not own a phone. Furthermore, this was long before Bebo, Facebook and the WhatsApp family group chat became a thing. At first, they presumed that she was busy or that she may have been visiting friends. However, alarm bells began to ring when she failed to show up for their weekly Friday coffee in Wexford Town. They reported her missing after they learned that she was last seen leaving Butler's in the early hours of February 9th. There is no record that the Carroll family made any effort to find out why Fiona failed to collect her daughter. They also did not become involved in any of the various searches. When investigators visited the cottage in Ballyhit, they noticed that it had been stripped clean of Fiona's belongings. Following public appeals, a local farmer came forward to say that he had found a number of black refuse bags in the corner of one of his fields. When he opened one of the bags, he found items that had Fiona's name and former address written on them. Sadly, this discovery was made days before Fiona was reported missing. At the time, he presumed that it was just another case of someone illegally dumping waste on his property. As a result, he burned the bags. It is unlikely that the killer was planning on murdering Fiona that night, as multiple witnesses saw him in Broadway. He made no effort to conceal his whereabouts or create an alibi for himself. The suspect is a man who was well known to Fiona. He knew where she lived and could have easily waited at her cottage instead of attacking her on the side of a public road. According to one news report from 2005, the suspect did not own a car or a van. On the night of the murder, he was on foot. Killing Fiona on the side of a road without having any means to move her body was a risky act on his part. So risky in fact that it's difficult to believe that any real planning went into this. Although murder may not have been his goal, there is no doubt that he wanted to punish her for a previous incident. There are also indications that he may have been intoxicated that night. The most plausible theory is that he quarrelled with Fiona about a previous incident. Then, at some point during the argument, he flew into a rage and killed her. Although 10 days passed before Fiona was officially reported missing, her killer would not have known that it would take that long. The problem, from his perspective, is that he did not own a vehicle. Initially, he would have hidden her remains somewhere in the vicinity. This would have been a nearby field, quarry or a wooded area. 
In the aftermath of the murder, he would have been in a state of panic. Her body lay close to where she was last seen and he knew that he was going to be the prime suspect. There is a very good chance that he did not sleep a wink that night. If he did pass out from the alcohol, the next morning would have felt like a nightmare. He would have spent the following day worrying about whether the Gardaí were going to show up at his door. Anyone who spoke to him during this period would have noticed obvious signs that he was stressed. He would have seemed aloof and bad tempered, almost unapproachable. When nobody showed up at his house and nobody contacted him about Fiona, it quickly dawned on him that he had a small window of opportunity. The first and most pressing issue was to move the body to a better location. However, to achieve this, he needed a vehicle. The first possibility is that he came up with an excuse to borrow someone's car. The second is that a close friend or family member helped him move the body. Regardless of which one is true, someone, either living or dead, knew that this man needed a vehicle in the days following Fiona's disappearance. The burial site is at a location that the killer was somewhat familiar with. He thought about this place and had it picked out before he returned with a vehicle. This was a location that he had a high level of confidence in. He was familiar enough with this place to know that it would be deserted on a dark winter's night. More importantly, he knew that the chances of someone noticing the grave were pretty low. From the offender's point of view, burying someone in a strange place is risky. It introduces far too many unknown variables at a time when they're already under stress. It is likely that he moved the body in the first two days after the murder. It has been claimed that he tried to gain access to her cottage two days after she was last seen. The fact that he approached her landlord so soon after she went missing is very telling. It indicates that he had already moved her body and disposed of her belongings by that point. As a result, he no longer had access to her house keys. Everything about this crime has to be viewed in the context of time. Ten days passed before she was reported missing, but he had no idea that it would take that long. When another 24 hours passed without someone questioning him about Fiona's whereabouts, he realized that he had an opportunity to tie up loose ends. He was well aware that he was going to become the prime suspect. To divert attention away from himself, he decided to remove her belongings from the house. That way, people might think that she had packed up her stuff and moved. This was a rushed and poorly thought out scheme. Approaching Fiona's landlord before she was reported missing was risky. The fact that he dumped her belongings in a farmer's field instead of destroying them shows us that he was under time constraints. Or at least he thought he was. This man had dumb luck. If this crime took place a year or two later, when mobile phones were more common, it is likely that her disappearance would have been noticed much sooner, and he would have had less time to cover his tracks. If the bags had been discovered after she was reported missing, the Gardaí would have had tangible evidence that someone had interfered with her belongings. Sadly, this case is stuck at a standstill. The hope is that Fiona Sinnott is still buried out there waiting for that one fateful moment when someone discovers her grave by chance. Hopefully, this discovery comes back to haunt the man who stole her life at a time when he least expects it. <laughs>